Because that doesn't create a place that a sales guy can work at for 20 years. It creates a place he's going to work at for one season or two seasons. I think the average sales guy in the industry only does it seven or eight months. And so then there was a huge shortage of labor. The guys running the guns and humping the shingles up the ladder started asking for more and more money. So then the, the crew foreman, you know, they had to ask for more money. And there was a pinch where the people at the bottom, I mean, there were guys who weren't nailing shingles unless they were making $300 a day or they wouldn't nail shingles. One thing I want to talk to you about today is about um, inequality in the roofing industry. Yeah. It's a really big topic for me. I hear a lot of uh, negative comments and feedback, especially from installers. A lot mm -hmm. of installers feel like it's not fair because mm -hmm. uh, salespeople mm -hmm. and business owners take advantage of installers. Right. And uh, I'm not going to share how I feel about it. I want to. Um, yeah. ask your opinion can you make money as an installer can you make like in the mm -hmm. roofing industry who can make decent living mm -hmm. is it true that sales guys do take advantage of everybody else mm -hmm. or business owners you know take advantage of everybody like about that <laughs> inequality in the roofing industry sure. just like we have inequality in the United States will building wealth mm -hmm. who can be right. become rich truly rich in the roofing sure. industry so there's two perspectives one is that uh, I don't think it's the sales guys taking advantage of anybody because the owners are deciding what those guys get paid. And so if there's, if there's an inequality in the system, I feel like it's got to start with the owners and their perspective of the people that work for them. Who makes them money, how they make their money, what, what people's jobs are worth, that's all in the, the eyes of the owner. You know? Now there is definitely market influence. You're going to pay similar to what everybody else is paying. But as a group, I think the owners are the largest influence on that. Um, uh, and I think that the, uh, the sales guys that people would say are taking advantage of the situation, like they're making more money, even they really, in the classic store model, they make more money than the owner, mm -hmm. you know, um, sure. that would come from the original storm chasers, you know, in the nineties and the two thousands, um, where they were hiring people that were only chasing money. They could sell anything. They didn't even care that they were selling roofs. They were just trying to get a signature on a document. It could have been for a car or a roof or whatever it was that got them their next uh, you know, hit of Coke and their next Ferrari they could drive around. That's, what, that's where all that originated. Um, I do think that it's not a sustainable model. A lot of people who pay their people like that never scale and grow very large. They get into their third or fourth year and they wonder why they don't have any money and they owe all these taxes and then you know, they really kind of look at it and go, man, this wasn't really worth it. I sold. So you think sales has been overpaid? In some cases, in yes. Some cases. In some cases, yes. Especially in the storm chasing model where, okay, I see it, it, It's certainly possible. Now, there are a lot of people that are figuring that out now. They're charging, you know, they might still pay 50-50 on the split, but they're charging 15% on overhead instead of 5 or 10%. And then a lot of the old school guys don't charge any overhead. They just do a straight 50-50 split. And it's not so much about the, the sales guy getting paid too much. It's not really about that. It's about that that's just not a sustainable business model. That doesn't create it's about a place. Of the business. Right, because that doesn't create a place that a sales guy can work at for 20 years. It creates a place he's going to work at for one season or two seasons. I think the average sales guy in the industry only does it seven or eight months. You know, um, And either they make a bunch of money and they do it for a year or two until they get burned out. But most often they come in for six months and then it takes them that long to realize they're not going to get paid what they were promised. And then they leave because they're not getting paid. That's really the, the average sales guy's story in those large, you know, storm chasing scenarios. Um, so I think the problem, if you're going to say there's a problem there, it really is probably in the owner's perspective. But I have seen many companies, and especially in the last three years, that are realizing, man, the goal of this business has got to be to be sustainable for our employees, for our customers, for the, the vendors and tradespeople that depend on us as for a flow of business. We've got to be stable. That's success in business is surviving growing and then having some money left over, having some retained earnings to either give to the owner or reinvest back in the business, that has to be what, it, what you're measuring. Because sure. you know? if you're just measuring volume, you're, you're probably not making very much money. Um, and uh, if you're taking every, every single job, if, you're, if your goal is to milk every red penny out of every single job, it's not a great experience for anybody. You know? Not that you want to waste money, I'm all about being frugal. I mean, you can tell from being around here, I measure everything. But um, you can't look at it as a one job, one time scenario, maximize it. And you can't look at it as like, I got to do the biggest volume. You know, I got to have $20 million in sales to be sustainable. That's not smart. You should be sustainable at 2 million or 4 million or 6 million. 
and then have money to reinvest and grow. And so I've seen a shift in that, but there are certainly, there's uh, some credence to the argument that there are salespeople who just get paid too much. How about business of installing? Can crews make money? Can installers make money? And how much no. money, what's their cap? Can installer make 100,000 a year? Is it hard? Is it mm -hmm. doable, possible? It's totally, installer? it's totally doable. Um, For a good roofing installer. Right. So uh, out of our Tulsa location, there was a crew that had three guys. They were all over 50 and they roofed each section of the house by themselves. They didn't have any help. They carried up their own shingles. They cleaned up their own messes. They did slope by slope. They were one crew, three guys, and they would pull 40 to 45 squares on eight or 10, 12 every single day. They got up early, they showed up, they didn't do anything but work. They didn't make, they don't make any mess because they're the ones that have to clean it up. They do everything efficiently. They don't do anything that they have to go do and rework. Those guys make really good money. That guy makes more than hundred thousand dollars a year who runs that crew, I guarantee you. Now your typical crew that has six or eight people and it's not super organized, not super efficient. Everybody's good. Their quality is good, but their efficiency maybe isn't good. Um, that guy should still be able to make 80 to a hundred thousand. I've run the math a bunch of different ways. We've, I've met with my guys that are, that are the crews that work with us and try to give them advice on how to build a model for themselves and build a system and track all their costs and stuff like that to make sure they're paying people right. Um, now there was an inflation in the market of pricing for labor around DFW, which affected a lot of Texas and Oklahoma. Um, I think from the 16 or 17 storms, I can't remember if it was 16, I think it was 16. Um, I think 600,000 houses in total got hit in Dallas in about four week period. Um, and so then there was a huge shortage of labor. The guys running the guns and humping the shingles up the ladder started asking for more and more money. So then the, the crew foreman, you know, they had to ask for more money. And there was a pinch where the people at the bottom, I mean, there were guys who weren't nailing shingles unless they were making $300 a day or they wouldn't nail shingles. And so the crew foreman would take it and he'd raise his prices, but he didn't raise it enough. And so he would end up not making any money in between. And so there's still some effect of that where I think the, the prices haven't come back down, you know, to like what they were before. Um, but insurance pricing didn't go up at all. It hasn't changed since that happened from 16 till now. It's still paying the same prices. So somebody, some people got squeezed in there. Some companies made a little bit less and, and some crew foreman got paid a little bit less. But um, obviously that might just be local. I know the labor prices are very different market to market. How do you think we can fix labor shortage? Because young people in states don't want to go mm -hmm. construction. You know, not motivated, not enough money. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a money thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's just... Uh, no, people just don't want to do that job. I put, I put ads in the paper for 25 bucks an hour. They don't want to do it. Not a single person showed up. Nobody. Um, some of it's an unemployment issue before the virus. Obviously, there was very low unemployment, which is good. Um, and upward mobility in the economy for the last 10 years had been very good. So when I started in this industry, um, drywall crews, if you want to look at framing or drywall around here, um, across the South, um, was um, undocumented workers. That was the labor. But there'd be, you know, a national of some you know, race or color that would be the owner. You know, some American of some color would be the owner and it'd be all undocumented laborers that were underneath that person. Um, that was 10 or 12 years ago. Now, those guys are now the owners of the frame companies and the drywall companies and the flooring companies and there's no more, you know, national Americans, I guess you would say, that are running those companies. But it's because those guys all moved up. Opportunity has created upward mobility was working. Everybody was moving up and roofers were like, well, if there's openings over here, I want to go work inside the house. I don't want to be on top getting sunburned and sweating. I want to go work on a drywall crew or a flooring crew. And then they start their own business. That's the American dream. It was all working. So that created a labor, labor shortage before we got to Trump when immigration stuff has gotten as heightened as it has. Let's it had. talk about immigration. Yeah, well, it was leading in into roofing, that. there's still a huge, huge uh, volume of uh, undocumented illegal uh -huh. immigrants who do the work. I mean, uh, is it fair to say that majority of the workers in the labor force in Texas are illegal? It's higher than a majority. It's higher than a majority. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? Like everybody? I mean, essentially, yeah. That's just the truth, yeah. And uh, is there anything they can do? Are we, do we have a big liability on our hands? Or we're uh, not from liable a, because... No, from a legal, a legal perspective, um, you're required to ask for the documentation that's necessary. 
what someone provides to you, it is not your job to validate that. I've met with sure. attorneys on both sides of this issue, the ones that are defending the undocumented workers, ones that are prosecuting people that are using them. And if you are gaining, if you're asking for and requiring the documentation that's required, I can't verify whether someone's green card is real or not, or whatever. I don't have the ability to do that. So I turn the stuff in um, and document it just like I'm supposed to. Um, the, the problem is, if you're gonna listen to the people that are trying to pander for your attention in the media, those people just want you to watch them and follow them and like them and share their little things on Facebook or whatever. They're making money off of you watching them. So they're gonna tell you the story that makes you watch. They're not really telling you the truth. And that's, in my opinion, working in film and television for a long time before I got into this industry, it's just about money. They don't actually, they don't, they're not sitting there with this great cause, like I need to defend the Republican agenda because it's the most right thing, or I need to defend Obama as a, you know, because I work for CNN or whatever, because it's the right thing. They the, do what sells. They do what sells. They're just trying to make TV that you watch. That's all there is to it. That's the problem with the coronavirus right now. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. They're just trying to make sure that you come back every day and you watch. TV virus. Yeah. So what they do is they create enemies. You know, anybody who doesn't believe or think like you is an enemy of your goal, your agenda, your vision of America or whatever. And so we can't tolerate them. We have to crush their efforts. And, you know, the only way to think is the way that we think. That's it. And so from one side of that story, what you hear is, you know, it's all these people sneaking across the border and stealing American jobs and not paying taxes and all that stuff. And there's some truth to that. There's a lot of them that don't pay taxes because there's not a way for them to pay taxes. And there's not a way for them to become legal. That's what people don't really understand. You can't just go to Mexico. You can't just go in Mexico and line up at some door and pay a fee to be able to come to America. It doesn't work like that. Other countries that are a plane ride away, maybe. The countries that our immigration uh, department has said, yeah, we can take you know, 200,000 people a year from that country because they're skilled laborers, they're good for the country, they do this, this, and this, yeah, we'll take them. Mexico is a whole other issue because it's been a hot, a hot spot uh, in the American political system for 25 or 30 years. And so the Republicans can't let the Democrats win because then the, the Democrats will get all the votes for the, the, that majority of people. And then the Democrats can't let the Repub Republicans make any successful changes to that either because then all the votes will go over there. So instead, they're just in a stalemate. They all talk about immigration stuff, but none of them has changed anything in 25 years since they've changed any laws that are significant to the immigration process from anywhere south of the Mexican border. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with the Heath Hicks. I absolutely love this talk about how much we make or should be making in the roofing industry. I'm inviting you to join our conversation in comments below. Let us know what you think. Who should be making more money? Is it fair game for all the players? salespeople, business owners, installers. I firmly believe that everybody have a fair chance to make good money in our industry, but I wanna hear your opinion. Please comment below, engage. I promise you I will answer your comment below.